Uh, so what Tracy asked me to do today was really focus on the methods around a qualitative study that we perform to understand rigor in preclinical lab research. Uh, so for those of you that are hoping for details on what we found, I'll have to defer that to the paper, which I'll link to at the end. Uh, I will give you some details, but I will be focusing mainly on the methods as this is what I was requested to do for this particular talk. In terms of objectives for today, uh, three briefly, and this was in the uh, email invitation as well too, but I wanted to demonstrate how we applied a qualitative method in terms of this interview study of lab scientists to understand rigor in the lab. Uh, I'll detail some aspects of the interview and analysis process. And I apologize for those of you that are uh, you know, purely qualitative researchers. This is a very high level overview. Um, so, um, you know, I apologize if you think it's overly simplified for those that have done some of these studies, but I will try to provide some of the details uh, for those of you that have not done this sort of study to understand the level of rigor that is actually involved in this type of study. And then finally, um, I'll show you how we've mapped some of our findings to practical implementation strategies to, again, address this issue of rigor in the lab. In terms of a little bit of background here, we have to back up here and actually travel back in time to 2012. And this was a highly influential paper. I think many of you that are in this area of matter research and trying to study what we do in the lab and how we do it, we can trace a lot of our interest back to this particular paper, which was published again in Nature in 2012. Glenn Bagley, who was one of the vice president, presidents, excuse me, of research at Amgen at that time. Amgen, for those of you that are unaware, is a very large multinational pharmaceutical company, billions of dollars at their disposal. So he and his team basically went about replicating 53 different studies that were published in very important journals. And the reason they were replicating them was that they were interested in developing what was found in those papers as drug targets for Amgen. And perhaps not so surprising now, but surprising definitely back then, was of the 53 studies that they tried to replicate, they were only able to replicate major findings of six of them. So a very small minority. And this really blew the door open on this Pandora's box of what we've labeled now as the reproducibility crisis in biomedical science, and in particular, what we do in the lab and how we do it. And this sort of highlights the translational valley of death that we often talk about where everything is evergreen on the side of the lab, everything works. And then the moment you try to cross this bridge into clinical translation here on the right, you have to traverse this valley of death where there's many, many casualties, unfortunately. And in the end, only a very, very small proportion of findings that were deemed important in the lab actually translate into anything that is clinically useful. So this is a very, very complicated issue. And sorry, before I even show this slide, I'm gonna back up here and just say it's a very, very complicated issue. And I don't wanna oversimplify it by saying, you know, reporting and guidelines are the answer. Uh, however, I will point out that there were, you know, of the multiple, multiple issues that were raised, many different funders and major organization co organizations coalesced around this issue of reporting and how we can improve that. And that came to this issue of reporting guidelines. Uh, there's two examples here. One was actually produced by the National Institutes of Health or the NIH. They came up with seven principles and guidelines that were essential when reporting preclinical research. So for instance, they said, when you are reporting in you know, an abstract or a paper form or any sort of form at all, in terms of your preclinical research, these are seven issues that you should probably touch on. This includes you know, distinguishing between biological and technical replicates, clearly, um, reporting on the stats that you used, mentioning randomization and blinding, et cetera. The actual details of this are not important for today, but only to know that a major funding body, the NIH, the biggest, largest biomedical funder in the world said these are important. And in parallel, uh, rather independently actually as well too, the NC3Rs uh, in the UK actually came up with a separate set of guidelines called the ARRIVE guidelines. This is specifically for animal-based research in the lab, and it's specifically a checklist to be used when you are putting together a manuscript of your findings. This was originally published in 2010 and then updated uh, more recently in 2022. 
Many, many similar elements, though, between the ARRIVE guidelines and what the NIH put together. However, what uh, many people found, including our group, was that although we have these guidelines, people simply aren't using them and reporting really has not improved. The bar graph actually summarizes two different studies that my group did, uh, almost a thousand papers there. There's a third paper, which I didn't put the data in there, but very, very similar results. So we have over a thousand papers that our group alone has looked at. And again, we are uh, by no means the only group. You can think of any domain of biomedical science, almost look up reporting guidelines and look up uh, adherence to them. You will find studies, I can almost promise you. Uh, and all these studies show very, very similar results in that, again, looking at at least the NIH seven principles and guidelines, the domains that they brought up, uh, very, very poor reporting. This is percentage of papers that are reporting on these different elements on the y-axis. And most of them fall below 20%, as you can see. Uh, and we set the bar very, very low here. We weren't even talking about whether they reported on these in a way that was replicable or very clear. We were simply looking for any mention of any of these issues within these papers themselves. So you can see overall, very, very poor, what we call implementation of these guidelines that are being promoted by major funders and organizations around the world. So in answer to this, we can look to clinical research again, and a particular area of uh, clinical research called implementation research. So implementation research can provide maybe some answers to this issue that we're having. What implementation research is, is the scientific study of methods to promote the uptake of research findings. Uh, so in other words, implementation scientists, science and scientists try to close the gap between what we know and what we do. This is often described as the research to practice gap and by basically identifying barriers to this research to practice gap and implementing behaviors that we want and enhancing facilitators, we might be able to close the overall gap that exists. I want to provide a, a successful example of where implementation research has really worked. And there's many, many examples in clinical research. So in terms of what we know, well, I can think about, or I can tell you a little bit about uh, one example where, where we're putting central lines into patients in intensive care units. So these are very, very big intravenous lines that go either in the neck or underneath the collarbone, large veins that exist there. And we need these in patients in the ICU and in intensive care units that are critically ill because we are putting in bucket loads of drugs and fluids into these patients to keep them alive. So in order to do this procedure, uh, there's certain uh, you know, clinical pathways that people use and practices. However, what we found about 20 years ago was that the infection rates around putting these lines were sky high, and it actually led to morbidity and mortality. So in order to address this issue, uh, one group, uh, and this is actually a very large group, 108 ICUs in this particular study, they implemented a checklist for central line insertion, and they found a dramatic effect, 66% decrease in infection. So absolutely massive effect. You know, you can, for those of you that are more familiar with clinical studies, you never see this sort of effect in any clinical study. So uh, it's absolutely massive. However, what they found was despite the publication of this result in a very important journal as well to New England Journal of Medicine, they said they found that very, very few changes were occurring and infection rates remained quite high across ICUs around the world. And what people in this field recognized was that simply having this checklist was not enough. We need to figure out what are the barriers and facilitators, what will make people actually change their behavior to adopt this checklist. So simply having it in front of them is not enough. Actually doing what is on that checklist is a whole other matter. So what they found through many, many studies was that in order to move our research, which is our checklist here into behavior change, they had to address several barriers and facilitators. And they could do this by designating hospital leadership champions, by offering financial incentives for people to follow this checklist, by offering technical assistance and consultation so that people understood what these checklists were about, and also by performance monitoring as well too. So uh, all of these things actually led to behavior change, multiple papers after this, which demonstrated that, hey, if you actually take this implementation science approach, you can actually affect meaningful behavior change.
So moving back to our area of interest and addressing this issue of people not really using these checklists and not implementing rigorous methods in the lab, we sought to systematically identify barriers and enablers to implementing and reporting uh, the specifically the NIH principles and guidelines. We focused on this because there were seven at that time. It was very easy. Uh, and um, we thought that this was a nice place to start as they are the major biomedical funder in the world as well, too. But again, for those of you that are more familiar with ARRIVE, lots and lots of crossover between these NIH guidelines and the ARRIVE guidelines as well, too. So in order to address this issue, again, we're taking a qualitative approach. And this is a quote uh, that I really like. It actually, when you look at the context, had nothing to do with qualitative research, but qualitative researchers use this all the time. Uh, and I think it actually uh, nicely summarizes some of the impact of qualitative research. And the quote says that not everything that can be counted counts, uh, and not everything that counts can be counted. So in other words, Although everyone is measuring and reporting and measuring how much people are reporting on these guidelines, uh, simply quantitatively measuring it may not get to the heart of the issue. In fact, there's many times things that are extremely important uh, are being missed because we're simply taking a quantitative approach. Uh, the quote, uh, you'll actually see it ascribed to Einstein and other people, but we look at the origins of it. Apparently it first came together in this way by William Bruce Cameron, who's a sociologist. So let's take this qualitative approach then. And specifically what we did was we applied it in an interview study. And I'll pause here for a moment to uh, mention and emphasize that there's many qualitative methods. Uh, interview studies are simply one method within this umbrella of qualitative studies. Other qualitative methods can include nominal group technique. It can include focus group studies. It can include field studies as well too, where researchers are embedded with teams. So there's many, many different approaches to qualitative research. We are simply taking an interview study approach. So for these qualitative interview studies, we're seeking input directly from key stakeholders on their perspectives, knowledge, experience, feelings, et cetera, lots of things there, but basically understanding their opinions and their perspectives around a particular issue. In this case, understanding their perspectives and their opinions on the NIH guidelines, reporting and implementing some of those practices within the lab. When you do these interview studies, they're typically documented by audio recording and then subsequent transcription. Uh, I'll mention here that there's actually software that's free to use now if you're using Teams or Zoom to actually conduct these interviews, or you can simply use a tape recorder, which is what we actually did for this particular study as many of the interviews were in person. Uh, then they're actually transcribed uh, by the software, or um, we can actually pay transcriptionists, or we pay a poor undergrad student, maybe not pay them, but they will be doing it as they're part of the team, and they'll be transcribing all of these interview studies as well, too. And the advantage here is that you can help to collect very rich information through this method, and it's usually conducted for relatively new topics with a smaller sample size very exploratory work to understand some of the underlying issues that may underpin in this behavior, in this case, a behavior uh, or a larger issue, whatever it might be. In terms of thinking about qualitative research, you can think about them or bundle them into two broad approaches uh, when you're actually uh, assessing or analyzing the data that you get. Uh, one is an inductive approach where you have the data is uh, that you have collected through these interviews, it's analyzed to create a general explanation. In other words, it's a bottom up approach. So you have all these transcripts, you read them, and then you generate themes yourself. Uh, this is often called thematic analysis. You'll often hear uh, people talk about Braun and Clark's approach to thematic analysis. Braun and Clark are two qualitative researchers, um, probably the most two preeminent qualitative researchers who have come up with a very uh, nice approach. And they've actually described it in a textbook that was just published a couple of years ago or updated a couple of days a year, a couple of years ago, excuse me, uh, on thematic analysis and this bottom up approach. We just have the transcripts and you generate the themes yourself. The other broad approach that you can take is a deductive one. And this is where you take a pre-existing theory 
to help explain the data. This is otherwise known as a top-down approach. And this is actually the approach that we took and I'll be describing to you for this particular study. The particular theory that we used is called the theoretical domains framework. And I'll explain a little bit about that. Uh, but basically you'll hear me talk about the TDF. That's what this is, the theoretical domains framework. And what we're doing is we're taking our interview transcripts and then we are coding them and putting them into the different slots or domains in this case of this framework. So there's actually two different versions of the TDF you'll hear being talked about. Uh, the TDF2 is the newest version. And you can see the 14 different domains that are encompassed within the TDF. Now, the reason we use the TDF is that it is very, very popular in implementation research. Basically, the TDF can be applied to any sort of behavior that you're interested in. And you can say, well, what domains actually drive this behavior or influence this behavior? So here are 14 different domains that these, uh, they're actually psychologists, uh, put together and said, okay, these are different domains that can influence or drive any particular behavior. And it was created rather generically. It's not about any particular behavior at all. And they actually combined a uh, 100 plus different psychological theories to come up with these 14 domains. And that's where they were derived from. But anyone can take the TDF and apply it to a behavior of interest to understand the domains that might be driving or influencing that behavior. So for instance, uh, in our particular issue of understanding and implementing those uh, guidelines, the NIH guidelines, I mean, obviously you need to have some knowledge around those guidelines uh, in order to implement them or to change your own behavior around them. Similarly, social influences. So if you see your colleagues in other labs using these reporting guidelines, I would suspect that that would influence you to use those guidelines as well. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these domains, but I'll give you some examples as we go along. So in terms of the steps of a qualitative interview study, I've told you that we're taking a deductive approach. That was one of the first steps to be, um, to be made, or the first decisions, excuse me, to be made around this. And the next thing we wanted to do is actually clearly define our topic slash behavior of interest. And there's a framework called the ACT framework or the AACTT framework. And this was put together by one of our collaborators in this particular study, in our study, uh, Justin Presso. And they define the ACT framework through action, actor, context, target, and time. So the action being what is the observable behavior being performed, actor being who is the one doing the action, context, where is the action being performed, target who is on the receiving end of the action and time, when is the action being performed? So again, to put that in the context of our particular study, the action is the implementation of these seven principles and guidelines and reporting. We also took a little bit of a broader approach saying not only reporting, but also implementing this in the lab so that you could report on them in a uh, best practice way. The actor being the preclinical researchers conducting and reporting in vivo experiments, and we actually split this up into investigators or principal investigators, the heads of the labs, but also HQP. That's a very Canadian term. It's highly qualified personnel. In this case, we're talking about any senior personnel, PhD researchers or PhD students, excuse me, uh, or research associates or research assistants. So these are the people, the highly qualified personnel who are doing the experiments at the bench. Uh, the context is the laboratory for those that are at the bench and the office for those uh, that are principal investigators and largely writing up these studies at the end and planning them out, I should say, at the beginning. Uh, the target, so this is who's using the information downstream, and this is actually all of us, so preclinical researchers and the research community who read and use the results from these preclinical in vivo studies. And then finally, the time, well, we're thinking about it not only in the reporting phase, but also in the design and conduct of these studies as well. Second step is uh, developing the interview guide. So what's really nice with the TDF, again, it's been used throughout implementation research, largely in the healthcare side of things, but there's many, many examples of interview guides that exist in the TDF. Uh, 
In fact, there's papers on how to generate a TDF-based interview guide. Uh, I'll show you how we did that uh, with a couple of examples, but ultimately that leads to a interview guide that helps you conduct a semi-structured interview. So you have all these prompts that the interviewer can use to guide the interviewee through a discussion on this topic of interest, in this case, applying these preclinical guidelines. So here's our uh, 14 domains of the TDF off to the left. Uh, and again, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but looking at beliefs of consequences, which is one of the domains in the TDF, a sample interview question that we had was, what are some of the benefits of applying the guidelines? Uh, a second domain, environmental context and resources. What are the resources at your center or at your lab that you feel would or do facilitate your application of the guidelines? And these are not rigid questions. These are prompts that help guide the interviewer through the interview process itself. And we usually have generated one to two questions per domain to go and go through the interview and also to basically hopefully hit on a lot of different aspects that might affect this behavior of implementing or not implementing these reporting guidelines uh, within their labs. Uh, third step was determining a sampling strategy. So for this, uh, basically we had, um, again, identified investigators and highly qualified personnel as the key people that we wanted to interview or the actors, if you want to use the ACT framework. First of all, we used purposive and convenient sampling. We had two funders for this work, uh, the Canadian Vascular Network and uh, BioCanRx. They're both federally funded networks, one for cardiovascular disease, one for cancer. We said, hey, we want to interview your researchers who actually perform in vivo research uh, in the laboratory setting. And they were uh, very happy to help uh, with that process. So that was the purpose of slash convenience sampling. Now, once we had interviewed uh, either uh, PI, so um, uh, principal investigators or HQP, we then also did what we call snowball sampling. We actually asked the interviewees, we said, hey, uh, you know, do you know anyone else who'd be interested in participating in this particular study? Mm -hmm. And not only are we looking for someone, but we're wondering if you know of anyone that actually has alternate or um, differing opinions than you had presented today. So by that way, we're trying to get a bit more of a broad swath of opinions and perspectives on this particular issue. So that's called snowball sampling when we actually ask the participants to identify additional participants. So those that are interested completed the interview in person or over the phone at the time of their convenience. Again, we recorded those. Uh, in terms of sample size, we, call, we use something called the 10 plus 3 rule. And what that means is that we did 13 interviews to begin with, and then we coded the first 10. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that coding and what we did in the end, but we coded them, identified themes, and then we actually coded the last three interviews. And then we compared the last three interviews to what we found in the first 10 interviews. And if there was no new themes emerging, we said, okay, that's good enough. We don't need to proceed any further. Uh, and when you have the 10 plus three rule and the last three interviews, basically you generate or you find no new themes, you can say you found or you've reached data adequacy. You might hear some people call it data saturation. That term itself has sort of fallen out of favor. Data adequacy is usually what we're talking about uh, in the current uh, sort of use of, of this method. And uh, what we did, you'll see, is we actually ended up having 15 interviews. So we actually added an interview at a time to basically reach data adequacy. In terms of collecting uh, the data, so once, uh, you know, we, once we had our interview guide together, we actually had to put together an REB, a Research Ethics Board application, uh, and also have institutional approval. That was obviously done before any of those interviews I mentioned. Uh, each participant had to provide informed consent as well, too. And we did in-person and phone interviews, audio recorded, transcribed, as I mentioned. And that led us uh, to the next step of analyzing the data. So first of all, just a, a basic demographics table here. You can see the median age, uh, gender of the participants. Uh, we had 17 principal investigators and 13 HQP. Again, those are research associate PhD students, senior people at the bench doing this work. Uh, we had 15 from cancer and 15 from cardiovascular research. Uh, 
And you can see their median experience in actually performing this type of work at the bench. The interviews themselves were approximately an hour long. So you can think about that as uh, being a rather in-depth discussion one-on-one -on -one with each of these individuals to understand their perspectives on this particular issue. Uh, very briefly, I'll take you through four steps uh, as to how we actually coded these interviews in the end. So again, after the interviews were done, we uh, they were recorded, they were transcribed, and then we had uh, a team of two people, so two research assistants who are skilled in qualitative research, code quotes into the TDF domains. Mm -hmm. Then they generated belief statements and sub-themes in each domain. We then identified relevant domains um, and identified ones that weren't relevant. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And then generated global themes from all of that. Finally, this is a fourth extra step. We actually mapped what we found to behavioral change strategies. Uh, so this is a bit of a mouthful. Don't worry if you don't understand this. I'm going to take you through each of these steps very briefly. So step one is coding. Uh, we use this program called Enviable. It's the most popular program in the world for coding qualitative um, uh, uh, research, basically. So either you can use it for content analysis within papers, or in this case, we used it within an interview study. This is actually just a screenshot from a YouTube video, which shows you uh, how to code if you're a beginner in InVivo. Uh, but basically you have all of the transcript here. You can highlight various areas and you can code them, uh, in this case, according to the different TDF domains. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. This is a quote from one of our participants. So I would say resources funding would be one important factor and then have someone who's overseeing it. Then I would say that uh, the person ensures that the trainees are aware of this so that they're implementing it on a day-to-day -day basis. So in terms of the TDF domains, uh, we highlighted more than this, but just simply you can see the resources and funding. I think you would agree that that falls into what we call environmental context and available resources. And having trainees be aware of this, well, that's clearly falling into the knowledge domain. And again, our, our qualitative researchers, our assistants on the ground, very, very well versed on the TDF and what each of those domains actually means, uh, All both of them. And again, this is something that's done in pairs. Both of them had already done previous TDF studies as well too. And just say one of the coders had coded uh, um, you know, this into environmental context and resources, uh, but another coder had actually put it into a different domain. Uh, that actually shows up as a conflict within in vivo, and then they have a discussion around that. And it's a very iterative process that honestly takes hundreds of hours. <laughs> By the time you're done all of this, you can imagine 30 interviews that I told you about, uh, and this whole process, hour-long interviews, coding this, and then coming to a resolution where two coders are saying, okay, this looks like uh, we both agree that this particular utterance should fall into environmental context and resource. Second example, uh, I want to do good science. I want what I do to matter in the sense that if I have goals of taking it to human clinical trial to better the treatment of humans with disease, then I've done everything appropriately in a way that I'm sure that what I'm doing is justified to go forward to testing it in humans, that I'm not wasting resources, that I'm not putting humans in danger with the testing of it going down the road. I think that these are all things that are critically important to doing it properly or you can't justify taking it that far. So a little bit of a longer code. Oh, excuse me, sorry. And then um, we basically coded the first one. I want to do good science into goals. And then I'm not putting humans in danger, uh, et cetera, and under beliefs and consequences. So these uh, piloted bits and pieces are what we call utterances. And these utterances are then taken into the next step where we're generating belief statements and sub-themes. So here you can see the TDF domain of social influences. And again, I should just explain, this is a screenshot of the, um, uh, of the in vivo program that we're using. Within that, we had all these utterances that we've actually then grouped together under this sub-theme of animal care. Uh, and these are just utterances from each of the participants where they're talking about some aspect of animal care and how it influences it. Uh, here's a, another sub-theme where we're, it was relabeled, but at that time we called it everyone or community. So there's some aspects of community and how that plays into uh, basically implementing these guidelines within these individual labs. Uh, 
And that falls again under the general domain of social inferences, which is one of the 14 domains of the TDF. So we can see here that we've categorized or grouped our utterances under sub themes here that we've generated ourselves. And then finally, um, once you've coded all these interviews and you have all the themes, you can actually get counts. Okay, how many times did this particular theme, uh, excuse me, domain within the TDF of knowledge appear? And these are all the domains again of the TDF here. And we get a count, this is not our final screen here, we get a final count of how many times those actually appeared. And what you quickly see are ones that are relevant and irrelevant, ones that are zero or close to zero, they probably have no influence or very little influence on that particular behavior of implementing uh, these guidelines within the labs. And uh, however, in contrast, the ones where we had high counts, uh, lots of utterances around a particular domain, that would play into the fact that that domain probably is important in influencing the behavior of implementing those guidelines. So from there, we can figure out which ones are relevant and not relevant. And then we look at it, at it as a whole. And to look at all the results as a whole, we actually had several group meetings. It wasn't just the two coders. It was our whole team that was our co-author list uh, in the ultimate manuscript. We had an implementation scientist. We had a couple of uh, pure basic scientists um, who were interested in the study, but were not uh, implementation researchers whatsoever. Uh, we had people like myself who were kind of at that bridge and actually conduct uh, early phase clinical trials, et cetera. So we had this large team that came together and we discussed all our findings and we basically boiled all our findings down into four global themes. We just chose four um, and we had two barrier themes and two enabler themes. I'm not gonna go through all the details here, but simply to say that we said, okay, there's variability in awareness and current practices. That was a barrier theme number one. And barrier theme number two was that there's high costs and challenges of implementing these guidelines. You can see here the relevant TDF domains that play into this global theme and uh, some key points. And again, we're not going to go through the details here. You're welcome to look at the paper to see more details. Similarly, we had key enablers, and these are two global theme enablers. The first one being that benefits and proficiency uh, in understanding these guidelines increase the motivation and intention of applying them. So basically, if you understood the benefits and you were proficient at them, then that would actually increase your motivation and attention in using them. Uh, enabler theme number two was that, hey, we need supports and resources and system level changes uh, in order for people to implement these guidelines as well too. So last thing I was gonna show you here was how we actually mapped these global themes and our findings to behavior change strategies. In order to do that, we used something called ERIC, which is the Expert Recommendations for Implementing Change. So Expert Recommendation for Implementing Change, or ERIC. Uh, it's a very, very well-known uh, strategy where you're taking this wheel uh, and you have here your sources of behavior, uh, capability, opportunity, and motivation. In yellow, you actually have um, your TDF domains. This is a particular example, so not all the domains are there. Uh, but uh, you have your TDF domains there. And then in red and in uh, gray, you basically have um, your intervention functions and your policy categories that can be thought of as uh, methods to implement behavior change. Uh, so I'll give you a particular example here. We basically, and again, you can look at the paper for more details. This is a very global overview, but we said, hey, uh, based on our findings, education and persuasion, training and modeling, and environmental structuring are going to be necessary for us to actually implement behavior change when it comes to having people actually apply these guidelines in their labs. And we actually broke it down even further, saying preparation, capacity building, and implementation. So this top row here, education, persuasion, and training and modeling, modeling and environmental structuring, excuse me, come from this here. So you can see here, persuasion is here, um, modeling is here, training is here, and those actually mapped on to the yellow TDF domains here. So we said, hey, they're important domains. Remember I was telling you there's important domains and ones that were less relevant. 
Uh, well, we figured out which ones are relevant. We mapped them onto intervention functions. And then we also looked and used the ERIC guidelines to figure out, okay, what policy categories should we be looking at to implement change? So hopefully that wasn't too abstract, uh, but again, you're welcome to look at the paper for more details there. But uh, what we're again doing is saying, okay, we found the important domains. We're basically mapping them onto strategies that we think will work. And these strategies were developed by the ERIC consortium as things that really work within the healthcare setting. So, uh, and behavior changes within the healthcare setting as well too. So for instance, going back to that primary example of decreasing your infection rates within central line insertion by having people simply implement a checklist, right? So here, same thing, we're talking about a reporting guideline, almost a checklist as well too. In order for people to do that, these are the areas that we need to focus on. So finally, writing a report. Uh, the paper is here. I'll leave that up for a second here for those who are interested. We published it in PLOS Biology. It was uh, titled Identifying Bears and Enablers to Rigorous Conduct and Reporting of Preclinical Lab Studies. Uh, again, a, um, uh, a team that was truly interdisciplinary that came together. Uh, we had implementation scientists, basic scientists that work largely in the lab, uh, clinical researchers as well too, and people like myself that sort of try to bridge both. Uh, so finally, just a couple of slides here, our strengths and limitations. We used a well-established tool, the TDF, widely, widely used in implementation research and many, many qualitative studies. Uh, we try to uh, basically find out the perspectives and opinions of multiple stakeholders, investigators, and HQP. Our sample size was in line with the norm for this sort of study. And we thought we provided an in-depth view of what's actually underpinning this behavior and the implementation or the non-implementation of these guidelines. Some limitations, well, when you have these interview studies, you have this issue of social desirability bias. Are the interviewees just simply saying what they think we wanna hear? And that might be happening, right? And you can't really prevent that from happening 100%, but we can take measures to try to, uh, try to minimize that. Uh, I'll also point out, we just had cancer and cardiovascular researchers within our sample, so that may not be generalizable to researchers from other disciplines. And then finally, uh, we had some international interviewees, but it was largely Canadian academic investigators that we interviewed. So again, speaking to uh, potential generalizability issues of what we found. Last slide, uh, take home messages here. Qualitative research methods can uncover underlying reasons, opinions, motivations uh, that purely quantitative approaches may overlook. Our approach and the qualitative approach provides uh, depth and context to an issue, again, that may be missing from a purely quantitative approach. And then finally, uh, I want to mention, I hope they give me a little bit of flavor here, that the analysis is really iterative. Uh, it involves a lot of people, and it's actually dependent on the researchers. So if another set of researchers looked at the same data, they might come to some different conclusions. Uh, however, what's nice with the deductive approach, at least, is that we're all using the same sort of framework to try to slot all our different findings into. Just a acknowledgement slide here and I'll open it up for discussion.